So, yeah, Dr. Adonis Menon, I am Professor of uh, Endocrinology at uh, Amrita Hospital. Type 2 diabetes, as we call it, has uh, been uh, increasing at an exponential rate over the last, say, two, three decades or so. Um, and the main reason that people have focused on is the lifestyle changes uh, that has happened, you know, the sedentary lifestyle. You hear about this quite often, you know, uh, it's very much in the news. However, people are finding it very unable to change it, you know, the, the, f the fact that you need to have a very good lifestyle uh, as well as the stress, you know, and the impact of stress is something which we can't quantify. Now, we, world over, we are facing a huge increase. In India, I think we are, uh, it's rising to a scary proportion because uh, we have seen that the type 2 diabetes, as we call it, in, in children and in young adults has particularly increased much more than what you see in the rest of the world. And I think that is very, very scary because if that happens, then you're thinking of or you're looking at people who are going to live with type 2 diabetes for four decades or five decades or 40 to 50 years. And what that straightway brings into, uh, into focus is the fact that you will have more and more people living with complications of diabetes. So clearly we have with the modern treatments and the current medications and current uh, healthcare, we are certainly able to make people live longer. However, you will see more complications because they live longer means they have you know, higher chance or a longer period to develop these complications. And that is quite scary. So when you see a type 2 diabetes in a 70 or 80 year old, you, you of course treat it and, but you, you know that the chance of very long term complications is not a major issue because they obviously will have other comorbidities and you're reaching your, uh, you know, your kind of the f last few decades of life. However, when you see that in a 20 year old, I mean, I've got quite a lot of patients um, in their teens who have got type 2 diabetes. And it's, it's really difficult to treat it because you can't treat them with tablets because we don't know the effects of tablets over 40, 50 years. You can't treat them with insulin because many of, many of them would either be very active in school or in, um, in studies or, uh, and one of the biggest problem of insulin being the overweight as well, you know, the fact that they will gain weight. So the, to me, the biggest problem we are going to face or we are already facing is the di type 2 diabetes in the younger population and because that opens up a lot of new problems in the long term, you know, not perhaps not only now, but in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but also the, uh, in some patients of type 2 diabetes who might need the insulin pump and uh, those sort of advanced technology, we have that here. So yes, once you develop it, controlling the sugars is, a, is an aspect which we can do very well. But also very important is the fact that we should educate patients properly because what we see happening now is there is again a lot of information out there. In the, the media is giving, there is a lot of information. Social media is extremely active, but people find it difficult to know whether what is right and what is wrong. So you, you I'm sure if you open your WhatsApp order, you, you'll hear things like, oh, we have found uh, a cure for diabetes and you're not sure. Just uh, the other day there was a news in the news uh, that there is a vaccine that has come out for diabetes. And this is just something in the infancy and it's actually for the other type of diabetes. It's not even for type 2 diabetes. Now if you take type 2 diabetes, uh, as I said earlier, the biggest problem is, is not the mortality. Now mortality, we, have, we know from previous figures that uh, we say people lose about a decade of their life uh, lifespan with type 2 diabetes. So that is an often quoted figure. Now more than the mortality, what we are always concerned about is the morbidity of the disease. And of when you come to morbidity, there are any number of what we call as microvascular or macrovascular complications. That means involving the small blood vessels and the big blood vessels. The biggest two 
as far as I am concerned, which are really causing problems in our patients and we see a lot of this in our centre as well and elsewhere in Kerala as well as in India, uh, is one, retinopathy, the problems with eyes. But why is it so important? Because retinopathy can cause blindness and this is one t form of blindness that can be totally prevented if found early and if treated early. That is because of two things. One, you can very effectively screen the eyes. So if you have annual screening of everybody, then you can find out eye disease very early. And you've got very effective treatments in form of laser treatment and a lot of new advanced treatments in, to, uh, in the form of injections to the eyes and all that, which can preserve eye um, you know, visual acuity or vision. So I think if, if, we fo if there is one thing that we would like to focus on and prevent blindness, this would be one. The diabetic retinopathy is one area where we would uh, do that. And there's already a lot of even uh, government-led um, uh, programs uh, in, in terms of uh, diabetic retinopathy um, screening and prevention and treatment that's going on. So that's one area. The other area where uh, especially Amrita and our center has taken a lead uh, is the food problems, uh, podiatry. Now, the biggest problem, as I said, after eyes is the problems with the feet. So neuropathy and lack of circulation or peripheral vascular disease are two major problems in type 2 diabetes. And over time, these people get numbness in their feet. So they break the skin, they don't know about it, and they get an infection. Infections are much more common in diabetes, as you very well know. And this then leads to the cycle of infections and then leading on to amputations. Uh, which, as you know, it's, it's, it's a big shock to somebody in their 30s or 40s to have an amputation because their life totally changes. So we have done a lot of work around salvage, uh, food salvage, trying to prevent as a first step. If we can't prevent it, if people get problem, find it out early, treat it early so, th so that we can prevent amputation. So preventing amputation has been a major focus and we have got an established center with, with a multidisciplinary team. I think we have the biggest success we have had is in terms of uh, getting a team together of people, of surgeons, of physiotherapists and physicians and everybody else together uh, to form a team that has uh, really you know, worked in getting this problem um, you know, reduced in a big way in Kerala. Now the other problem if you ta take um, you know, of all the hormone problems that we deal with is the explosion of thyroid diseases that we see nowadays. And it has be, it's been a bit of a puzzle for many people why thyroid disease has gone up so quickly. Now there are many schools of thoughts about this. Some people say it's because thyroid function tests are much more easily available. People, are, people can afford to do a test in a drop of a hat. You can go to your next, next door uh, lab and do it. That might be true. But even giving consideration to all that, there is definitely an explosion of thyroid disease and predominantly hypothyroidism. Now, what we should understand is that thyroid disease are immune related diseases. So they are what we call as autoimmune disorders. Most of them are autoimmune disorders. So anything that triggers an altered immunity in our system is going to have its impact. And it looks as if there might be triggering factors in the environment, in the food we take, you know, in the water, we don't know. I mean, we don't know, we only know a little bit of this area. There's a lot of research going on, but we don't know. Now, the problem we have in, in Kerala or in India is that what we need is local research as to find out what exactly is causing, a, is causing these problems in our area. So, whereas w what is applicable in, say, in US or UK uh, in terms of a, uh, in terms of a uh, inducing agent or a precipitating factor may not be relevant here. The infections they have there is different. The, the sort of uh, the substances in the food or in the environment is different. Our water pollution is different. So we have so many factors that might be driving this. And I don't think we have really understood why this is happening. So currently what we are doing is we are, of course, treating them properly, making the diagnosis early, and giving them the right advice. But also what we should realize is there has been an increase in cancer, thyroid cancers. And that is also something which is concerning us. Now, again, we don't know what the reason is. And this again could be related to uh, what we call as 
endocrine disruptors. So there are a lot of endocrine disruptors and there are some which are very clearly known to cause some cancers. Uh, there might be some endocrine dis disruptors affecting thyroid also, but we are not sure what exactly is happening in our country. When it comes to uh, the thyroid problems, uh, we have uh, again, we have done quite a lot of field work around this. Uh, in, in fact, one of my colleagues uh, had done a PhD in the, in the, in the community work of thyroid, thyroid disorders. Um, she couldn't find a specific reason for it, but she could definitely find out that we have got much more increased incidence and prevalence of these diseases compared to the rest of the population. But this has, there, there is still work going on to find out what the reason for this is. So that is perhaps something which will take more time. The cancer, we have got a one-stop uh, thyroid clinic which has got all the facilities including you know, or say if somebody comes in with a doubtful or a suspicious lesion, uh, within that uh, half a day itself, we can get all the, uh, all the investigations done, get all the specialists involved, make a clear uh, treatment plan and move forward. So we have got very good teamwork and very good sort of uh, work that, is, that we are doing together, uh, which uh, is making life much easier for the patients. The childhood obesity is something which um, we have, you know, in the front of our eyes, we have seen it, uh, it evolving and it, you know, it becoming a huge problem. Now, uh, I personally do an obesity clinic, so I understand the kind of uh, problems that's happening in the society. What we are seeing is, whereas uh, obesity was not acceptable in schools, uh, among children, this is among children are always bothered about their peers, and say 20 years, 30 years ago, if there was one obese child, the other children would actually look around and you know laugh at them or make a comment. So children were found it socially not acceptable to be overweight. Whereas now, when we speak to children, they say, "Oh, half of my class is like this. So what's your problem?" So they, it is very difficult to make children understand. Uh, the long-term consequences because they are not at an age where they can understand the issues related to it. But this again almost definitely is related to the lack of exercise, uh, the stress that we are putting um, children through um, in schools, uh, their poor eating habits uh, and a lot of blame the parents themselves have to take for these things. Uh, because children are not an age where they can understand these things. So. Again, where do you start? Do you start it at home or do you start it at school or do you start it at a community level? We perhaps have to do it at all levels because that awareness has to uh, be spread across uh, the society.